Well, this will be my attempt to kind of transport us to the beautiful country of Japan. Because what you're looking at on my workbench is a Revere, which you may have never heard of before, but this machine is post-World War II and came to us by way of Japan after World War II. We, in an effort to try to help them rebuild their country, ended up giving them a number of patents and machine designs that they then made and used, the, the, used those monies by way of exporting those machines to try to rebuild their country. That was a, a part of it anyway. And one of the machines they made was this Model 60 Deluxe Precision Revere model. And this model belongs to Sue, who is part of a very cool quilting group in this neck of the woods that I call home now. And uh, we met and she had brought another machine to me as well. And uh, this machine had some wiring issues and some other mechanical issues that I had to resolve and then just get it all tuned up and ready to go. And it is really a surprisingly powerful machine, even in comparison to some other machines that I've had that have larger motors. This one comes with a 0.7 amp motor, which is nothing, you know, nothing small. <laughs> it actually is a, a slightly larger motor by a tenth uh, of an amp than even the Singer 201-2 or the Singer 1591. Now, the advantages those machines have over this, however, is that they have that potted direct drive motor. Uh, they are not a belt driven motor like this one so but getting back on track I guess with sharing some particulars of this machine it's really the composition uh, or the compilation of two different very popular Singer machines if I rotate it a little bit I think I'll give it away right away And rotating, it's no small effort. This is a super, super heavy machine. And hopefully I've rotated it enough that you're going to be able to see kind of what I'm hinting at. So what you can see from the front right away is it has that classic upper tension control on the faceplate which is a direct reflection of them modeling it after the Singer 1591. The other thing you'll see a little bit further back is it has a light assembly that's molded to the body on the rear of the machine. Now if this had been moved to the front of the machine it would be a direct reflection of the Singer 201-2. So the Japanese are very smart people, especially in the business realm when it comes to knowing what's going to be popular with the audience that they're going to bring this machine to. So they took two of the greatest machines that Singer ever made, the Singer 201-2, the Rolls Royce of Singers, as I had just introduced to you through a premiere uh, with Diane's machine that's going to be going out to California this week and also the Singer 1591 and they they brought these two together I think brilliantly to make up this Revere machine and it really is a really a, a pretty spectacular machine as I went through it surgically as I always do the engineering of this machine the design the build of it is really really impressive and again kind of like the recent Taiwanese machine if you take machines back to the 50s there was still a lot of pride in the way they built out these machines and this Revere is certainly no exception that belongs to Sue so this is a I think a great example of a Japanese machine I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the other workbench and show you another machine also made in Japan that I think is also a great example of quality engineering. 
I'm actually going to show you two machines side by side here. So what we have on the left is a classic Singer 1591. Really doesn't require much introduction at all. On the right is a universal machine, also made in Japan like Sue's machine. And you can see they modeled it after the class 15, having that upper tension control on the faceplate, just like Sue's. What they did with this machine, and take into account these machines were also distributed in Japan. And the Japanese culture is very classy and very ornate. So as you look at this faceplate compared to this faceplate, you can see right away the Japanese version that I'll call kind of a class 15 clone has a very ornamental type faceplate. Very much like Sue's, if I kind of shoot back across the room real quick, you know, this is not quite as ornate, but it has a lot of uh, decorative touches to the faceplate that far exceed what this classic Singer uh, 1591 has. And it's because the Japanese not only were marketing this uh, universal uh, in the U.S. as they exported it to us post-World War II, but they were also trying to promote it to the Japanese culture as well as an option. And that's why they gave it such an ornamental type look even down to you know the filigree you can see the filigree here on the 1591 and if you move over to this it's just a little bit more decorative and that again is because they were appealing to two audiences uh, as they were trying to rebuild their country which is why we gave them the u.s uh, patents and designs for so many different sewing machines uh, they wanted to appeal to both of those audiences and be successful so they wanted to obviously brand it as something that came from their country. I don't know if you can see it from this angle. I may have to move it a little bit. You can kind of see it made in Japan. So they were proud of the fact, hey, we made this in our country. But at the same time, as they were looking to appeal to that audience and say, hey, we're made in Japan, they also wanted to make the make the case make the point that this machine also had u.s roots as they were bringing it into the u.s so they went as far as as i rotate this around they went as far as to actually on the back of their machine and i think you'll be able to see it in this shot of actually putting on the back of their machine that it was also let me keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. That it also was U.S. rooted as well. And they did that by on the back of this machine, if I can get it to focus, by specifically branding it with registered U.S. patent office is kind of what that abbreviation is meant to do. Uh, it's meant to say to the U.S. people, hey, yes, made in Japan, but... This is patented based on U.S. engineering, based on U.S. culture. So they really, through this universal machine, very much like Sue's machine, they were bringing two cultures to the table and saying, this is the best of both worlds. You're getting a, a Japanese uh, engineered machine that was built off of a U.S. patent. And then they went even so far to go beyond that in saying, Many of our machines that leave Japan and come to the United States are also going to be carrying a General Motors Delco 0.9 amp motor. So when you're trying to sell things in another country, you've got to bridge those gaps so that that culture that you're bringing this product to are not going to object to it. So the Japanese, being very smart, first of all, stamp their machine with a U.S. patent type mark and then they also put on a General Motors Delco motor. So the people in the U.S. looking at this are saying, oh, okay, this is fine. And very smart approach to crossing those boundaries of bringing a product 
and making it a compelling case for why people in the U.S. should buy it and why people in Japan should buy it as well. So, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> marketing, 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 marketing. It's so compelling, isn't it? And they even, if you look at these machines, I'm going to kind of shift them around a little bit more even. You look at the front of the machine as well. They mirror and match this beautifully as well, I think. You look at them side by side, and then we kind of zoom in on the Japanese machine first. What do we have? Same bobbin winding style uh, for winding a bobbin. Serialized on the front of the machine, very much like a Singer machine. Beautiful uh, badge mark on the front of here. Uh, they love the word deluxe. They love the word... Uh, uh, what's the other word? Oh, I'm trying to think of it. It's on Sue's machine. Precision. That's it. So Precision Deluxe is huge as they branded these machines and sent them out of Japan post-World War II. Um, same type of control center. Even the same markings, the same color as the Singer machine. You know, as we go over here, you'll see uh, right away, if I can move the camera right, same type of control center. Now, I didn't clean this machine up yet, so forgive me for that. But you can see same type of marking uh, as that one. Same uh, regulator for uh, putting stop points on the stitch length. Uh, badge mark, you know, in the same area. Same coloring. Serialized, filigree, bobbin winder, blah, 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 blah. We're going to make these machines so close that neither culture is going to have an issue with them. And we're going to brand them in certain ways so that both cultures will love them and embrace them. So, really brilliant. I think it's super smart on the part of the Japanese people. They are very smart people. So, let's do what we finally set out to do. And that is go back to Sue's machine. Yes, a little bit more Japanese music. And I've got to move this thing around now to get it in a position where we can actually sew with it. Right? <laughs> That's why we're here. Duh. All right, let me see if I can rotate this back around again. Oh, Lordy. Let there be no mistake. These machines definitely are built solid, these Japanese machines. The only thing I'll say is you've got to be careful with these japanese machines because what what they did i'm going to kind of really zoom in and get the foot control in position and everything and really get us back on track with what we set to do um you've got to be a little bit careful because some of the japanese machines the earlier ones right after the war when resources were very limited and raw materials were really hard to come by the Japanese did sometimes use pig metal to make some of these earlier uh, machines that they exported to the US. And those of you that aren't familiar with pig metal, it's a less than pure type of metal and they oftentimes would get it from vessels uh, that had been sunk. They would actually use that metal from the large ships and uh, manufacture machines out of that and uh, when metal sits in seawater for quite a while plus when it's less than uh, high quality pure metal it has a propensity to rust and so some of the earlier Japanese models uh, had that propensity I don't think Sue's is in that class it's a little bit later on uh, as is the other Japanese Universal that I showed you but nonetheless, you do have to be aware of that. If all of a sudden, after watching this video, you get excited about Japanese post-World War II uh, clone-type machines like these two that were modeled after a number of Singer machines, make sure you pick out one that's later in the phase so that you don't end up with that issue of the machine kind of rusting from the inside out, uh, which could happen. So, all right, let me see if I can get a little bit closer... Yeah, there we go. A little bit closer on this machine. 
So this machine, I can't remember if uh, I've been running around doing different things today. I can't remember if I mentioned it at the outset of this video, but uh, I think I did. Sue's machine had some electrical issues. It had a few uh, mechanical issues. It also had, and this is where uh, traction and launch are so critical when you're uh, prepping a machine to have a optimal sewing capacity. By that I mean this machine came to me with a stretch belt on it. Stretch belts are really an easy quick fix when you're looking to find a belt to put on a machine like this because unlike the 1591 and the 201-2 that this machine was kind of modeled after, this machine does not have direct drive. It doesn't have that gear to gear benefit, that positive traction that those two Singer models have. This is a belt driven machine. So picking the right belt for it, just like having the right motor brushes for a motor when you're trying to optimize that machine. And you're not gonna get that from Craigslist or eBay. Uh, folks don't even think at that level like we do about how can we make this machine perform maybe even better than it did when it left the factory. That's always my objective, you know that. So I switched out that belt right away after I measured, did a number of measurements to get just the right belt on this Revere Deluxe Precision Made in Japan clone machine. <laughs> what a mouthful. So I think you're going to really be impressed by the performance of this machine. If you've ever sewn on a Japanese machine before, they sometimes they don't do a real good job. Uh, I'm just being honest. But I think you'll really be impressed now that I've optimized Sue's machine as to what this machine has the capacity to now do. It's really, really cool. So I'm going to get my seat all set and see if we can't uh, get this machine. And I'm going to turn the light on as well. It's got a good lighting system. Again, they basically flipped the lighting system from the front to the back. Uh, the type of lighting systems that's that that's on the 201-2 so and that is a decent that's a real decent lighting system obviously on the the Rolls-Royce of Singers so I see my shot is is pretty good in line uh, we're gonna sew a number of different things on this Revere we're gonna do uh, cowhide we're gonna do uh, that um, snake skin that's on a leather uh, type base we're going to do some vegetable tan leather, and we're going to obviously do U.S. Army grade canvas. And uh, I think you'll see just how how well when a a machine, whether it's Japanese or otherwise, once it's been on my workbench, it really can do some pretty spectacular things. And I'll try to keep my arm out of the way as well because I know that that tends to mess with the focus on this. So the first thing I'm going to first thing I'm going to zip down is this uh, genuine cowhide. We're gonna be sewing uh, two layers. I thought about just doing a single layer and then going into two layers, but I almost think that's a little bit pretentious because you know once I've worked on a machine, it's got the capacity to do things that other machines can't. Uh, so I might as well just you know put the rubber to the road and show you what it can do out of the gate. So here's two layers of genuine cowhide. I don't think I have this completely level because I'm getting a little bit of a, a rock on it. I'll have to take a look at that. All right. I've got it on my uh, AstroTurf stuff, and I sometimes I think I get that a little bit out of balance. But it did really well in spite of that. And you know what? When you're looking at stitches like this, I'm going to try to bring my light in a little bit as well. It just it tells the whole story. You can't get, I'm going to try to look at the camera angle so I can really present this well for you. You can't get a better stitch than that. I mean, it's just, it's spectacular in every respect. The spacing, the formation, the consistency all the way down. The risk whenever you're sewing at this level is that you can have, and, and some people almost presuppose that they're going to have missed stitches because it's such a demand on a machine to be able to sew this is basically eight to ten ounces of uh, genuine cowhide that's no small task but 
it's consistent from top to bottom from the very first stitch to the very last stitch the spacing the formation the integrity of the stitch is just absolutely spot on and as we turned it over you know what you shouldn't expect anything less from the lock stitch the lock stitch also is absolutely spot on as well the spacing the formation the overall presentation and the integrity of that is just spectacular and again we just did two layers of genuine cowhide eight to ten ounces it would absolutely choke most other machines out there uh, even classic singer machines that haven't been restored or serviced properly so I'm really I'm really really happy uh, with the look of that stitch as a matter of fact let me real quick I usually try to do this at the end but I've got this real close to the edge of my workbench and it's going to be a little bit awkward so let me see if I can zoom in on these right now why not right we'll just get it done so look at those all the way across absolutely spot on see if I can even get a little bit closer but I think this camera is doing about as well as it can do so really gorgeous stitches okay so let me zoom back out a little bit and we'll move on to the next sew off without any more delay definitely a pass on this genuine cowhide just beautiful all right so what we're going to do now is we're going to do some vegetable tan leather i'm going to do two layers of this as well but instead of having two pieces cut I'm going to fold them in half and just sew through it this way. And hopefully I'm lined up okay on the shot. It looks like I am. So I'm going to put this underneath the presser foot. And again, because <clears throat> this Revere uh, Deluxe Precision Made in Japan machine is modeled after the 1591, it has incredible clearance underneath the presser foot. It does a phenomenal job there. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to sew, da sew down... I'm going to slow down and sew down <laughs> this vegetable tan leather, two layers of it, make a turn, and then shoot back down, try to make a little uh, square. It's not going to be a perfect square, but you'll get the idea. All right, so here's two layers of vegetable tan leather. Here we go. And I'm going to do my turn. And sometimes I have the needle in the material, sometimes I don't. So when we look at this, it may... Um, look as if I missed a stitch but I didn't it's just a matter of uh, I pulled the needle out on some of these turns so it is what it is all right one more turn and for Donna's sake I'm gonna leave it in the material this time all right there we go not a bad square not a bad square at all yeah I'd say it probably gets about a six out of ten all right, a 7 out of 10. <laughs> All right, let me cut this and get this back into position because we're not done sewing yet. So here we've got, you kind of look at it from the end here, we've got two layers of vegetable tan leather. Uh, there was really no strain on the part of this machine at all. It, it did a brilliant job of making its way through these uh, two layers. It uh, laid down some beautiful stitches. We're going to have to tr see if we can zoom in on these as well. Although I know on this leather, it's a little bit harder to see that definition. It just is. Kind of pull it back. Let me see if I can pull it back like this. You could probably see it a little bit more clear. Keep my big old hand out of the way, though. So I, I'm really pleased with that. It looks really good. And also on the lock stitch, it did a brilliant job as well. Again, we're not talking about a light sew-off here. We're talking about probably eight to ten ounces of vegetable tan leather this stuff tends to be a little bit uh, stiffer it's a little bit harder to pierce it the piercing threshold is higher kind of like Italian leather and uh, this job I think th this this machine did a brilliant job with its 0.7 amp motor of uh, I mean just buzzing through it br brilliantly here you can see those stitches on the lock stitch as well the spacing the formation is just just spot on it's it's spectacular I love it so I'm gonna throw this to the side as well definitely as a pass and I think it did a great job what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna move right into this leather snakeskin and again it's called leather snakeskin because it's got snakeskin on the top and then it has a leather base to it that's genuine leather right there 
So I'm going to slide this underneath the presser foot as well, and we're going to buzz down this. Two layers is not a huge challenge, but snake skin, like other materials, uh, will tend to resist that needle and try to cause it to miss stitches and to skip stitches. So let's see how it does on this. Here we go. I'm, I'm like 12%, if that, down on this foot control. Uh, Sue, I, I went through this motor very carefully. Uh, it didn't have really impressive power when I started working on this machine. And I think she's going to be like, holy mackerel, I better put on my seatbelt. Because it's, I mean, honest to God, I was, I was like a fraction of the way down. And it did a brilliant job on this snake skin as well. Um, I can try to zoom in on this a little bit. We might be able to see this better than that vegetable tan leather. And also the lock stitch, you can see that clearly on this. Really, really presents well. It just looks spectacular. I'll try to zoom in on that a little bit and see if we can, if I can get it to stand up. Uh, it's always the challenge, isn't it? When you're doing a live video to try to get things to work just right. <laughs> All right, let's see if, see if we can get a little bit closer to this. Take a look at those stitches as well. I wish you could see them from where I'm sitting because the camera does not do justice to these stitches on this uh, snakeskin leather at all. It just doesn't. Kind of see the thickness there, though. It's not a light sew-off at all. Not even close. If we turn it around, come on. Oh, come on. Really? All right, we'll put it up on top of the presser foot. That'll work even better. I love it. I should have done that with the other side. Come on, light. I got a like a crazy light here where I pull it down and it pops back up. I guess that's by design. I don't know if that's a good design. <laughs> All right, where am I? Where am I? Oh, there we go. Okay. So here we're actually looking at the lock stitch. And you can see as I go across, the spacing, uh, the formation of that is just absolutely spot on. Again, almost like working with um, a, a vinyl type material. Uh, snake skin, when you put it with leather, is one that really tries to mess with your stitch quality and really tries to cause that needle to skip stitches. and. That's simply not the case here. It just looks spot on. Now that I figured out the secret to displaying this, let me see if I can flip it real quick and show you that other side, maybe with a little bit more clarity, although with these, with these scales, it's probably going to mess with it a little bit, or it'll mess with me just because it knows that I want to show it. <laughs> so as we go across here, you can, yeah, you can definitely see with greater clarity now the quality of that stitch. machine really is impressing me just like the previous machine uh, that was from Taiwan it, it really has done I think it's done a, uh, an excellent job but again a lot of that I say this to customers every week as I get emails as I get notes from folks about talking about wanting to buy this machine or looking at this machine on Craigslist and their their inspiration for doing this is they've seen one of my videos on this machine. It could be any machine, any machine at all. And they'll, they always make that statement of, I'm so excited to find this machine because I want to be able to duplicate what you did. All I can say is get used to disappointment because when you spend as much time as I do on these machines, even with a general service and a rewiring like on Sue's, four to five hours, compared to other people winging it out quick and dirty and doing a, a half half cock job on it, you know, not a, not a quality job, you're not going to get the same results. I mean, you just can't. How could you? So, you know, all I can say is this machine is continuing to impress me, but a big product of that is what I put into it. It, it just is. You get, you get out what you put into it. And what we're going to do now is really do one of my favorite sew-offs and that is this US Army grade canvas. It does such a great job of showing off 
the what the stitch quality is of a machine when it's optimized and just like on the recent sew off I did on Diane's Singer 201-2 Diane Hanks that machine that's going to go out to California uh, I wanted to duplicate the canvas US Army grade canvas sew off on this Japanese machine just to show you what the possibilities are when the right person has touched that machine to get it to the optimal level. So we're starting with two layers. I'm going to fold it in half. We're up to four. I'm going to fold it in half again and we're all the way up to eight layers. Can you see that? That's nuts folks. And I'm going to struggle probably a little bit with getting it underneath the presser foot. But again with this Japanese clone machine being basically a duplication of the Singer 1591, look at that. We got it underneath that presser foot with room to spare because this machine was designed to be like a 1591 and that's one of the greatest things that people love about the 1591 is the presser foot clearance. Alright, so here I go. Eight layers of US Army grade canvas. Here we go. not even an effort on the part of this machine and people will say to me you know what I really I love the way that machine sounds I love the way it purrs I love the way it whatever you know there's all kinds of words you can use to describe a machine and the way it sounds this one and this is gonna sound odd especially if you've never had this type of pet before but over the years we've had rabbits as pets and rabbits when they get excited or even scared or when they get aggressive and if you've never thought of a rabbit as aggressive holy cow they can be animals that are like cougars when they get really excited they thump their feet and this machine when it's going through these different sew offs not because it's belabored but just because that's the way it sounds when it's running optimally it has almost like a almost like a, a big truck or something like that just mowing through the sew offs and even on these eight layers of US Army grade canvas it laid down just an absolutely perfect stitch the spacing the formation the integrity of the stitch is just spot on look at it again from the side folks that is no easy task at all and as well with the lock-in stitch it's just done an absolutely spectacular job if I bring it different ways you'll really be able to see that stitch uh, present beautifully. And you know this is so obvious unlike the leather ones where it's a little bit harder to see I don't know that I even need to zoom in on this. You can broaden your screen a little bit and really look at these uh, close and I'll kind of move it back and forth a little bit but it's done just a, a fabulous job, a fabulous job on every single one of these sew offs whether it's this eight layers of US Army grade canvas the two layers of leather snakeskin, the two layers of really tough to get through vegetable tan leather, or the two layers of genuine cowhide leather. Every single one of those sew offs was just like a done deal for this really, really cool uh, Japanese Model 60 Deluxe Precision Machine from Japan. So I'm not sure how you say fabulous in Japanese. I only know Konnichiwa and Ogenki Deska, which is, how are you? Well, I'm doing great. I'm doing fabulous with how this machine uh, is sewing. And again, I know it's going to be a real pleasant surprise to sue uh, because it definitely, it definitely was not sewing at this level uh, when she brought it to me. And I'm sure when she tried it as well. So, you know, it continues to remove the bias that that I know I have sometimes when I hear Japanese machine I think of the really early ones that were kind of slapped together and that they used pig metal on and, and they just weren't anything to brag about and even the engineering had not been really perfected or and even though they had the patents and the designs that we gave them you know the things just were just kind of slapped together and they weren't really great but this later Revere model and certainly the Universal that you saw as well these machines were done right 
they were done with some level of pride and, and folks that have them, assuming that they're running as well as Sue's, which they probably aren't, but if they can get them to that level, that's gonna be a go-to machine for quilting, for heavy grade sewing, for daily leather sewing. I'm gonna say it again to my friends in, in the UK because I know they watch my videos faithfully. And uh, this particular couple just really took issue. I shared this with you and I know I'm ranting again, but when you get a machine that's running right, you can lay down stitches on leather again and again and again and again and again. And you can use it as your go-to machine, even for your business, doing it seven days a week if you want. You just have to maintain that machine properly and uh, change those needles out frequently. That's a big part of it. And take care of your machine, just like you would any other investment, your car. And that machine will deliver and continue to amaze you as to what it can do. I mean, that's, that's what machines are supposed to be when you take care of them. They're supposed to be something you can count on to deliver the same results every single time. And I'm telling you one thing, when Sue gets this home, she can run it through the races, she can sew off on the same materials that you've seen me sew off on, and this machine will deliver again and again and again. So, all right. Well, God bless you guys.